kind of, you know, aches and pains and, you know, not being able to do what we used to do. Um, so I, you know, I'm excited that uh, Donna is here today. So Donna is a yoga teacher, a health coach, um, an Ayurveda teacher, and um, also runs uh, an awesome program called Align and Thrive that I highly recommend. Um, and just like a little bit of background, um, I, I uh, first got to know Donna at a time in my life where I was, I did not have a lot of energy and I felt, I just felt really, really burnt out. I, I was burnt out in my work. Um, I was burnt out in my home and, um, and I just felt like I could be doing more just to, uh, just to start getting more energy before I could even start working on anything else. And so I took, um, I've, taken two courses with Donna so far, the Align and Thrive and the Do Your Dharma. Um, but I started with Align and Thrive. And um, the things that uh, I think Donna's going to talk about today, those simple daily habits that we learned in Align and Thrive have still to this day, I, don't, I think it was like five or six years ago now, um, they're still like my bedrock of they're like my foundation that has allowed me to be able to teach, to be able to even, you know, put on this course. And I still use them today, which kind of astounds me because, you know, I'm not really good at sticking to habits. So um, anyway, that's why I thought uh, Donna would be the perfect person to bring on to talk to us. Um, because we don't need any more overwhelm. Oh, we need like simple habits to just get that foundation going again. So, so welcome. And I can't wait to get up for me to get a refresher and <laughs> reminded of all this important stuff. Thank you. Thanks for yeah. having me and mm -hmm. welcome you guys. So have you ever had the thought, no, I, I know I need to take better care of myself, but I have no energy or no motivation or I'm so overwhelmed and stressed and then you just end up actually procrastinating more or, or doing things that make you feel even worse. Like maybe that's overeating or over drinking or overspending or any other kind of like coping mechanisms that we often go to, to, to get relief from, from feeling stress or any kind of negative feelings. Or have you ever felt like you want to be more active, but you just don't have the energy? So if, if any of that rings true for you, then <laughs> you're not alone. And I've, I've coached hundreds of people and I think energy is always at the top. It's always, you know, something that most people are struggling with. So, you know, the, the question is why? Like, why do so many people struggle with low energy. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Why? Because I think it's really important to understand that it's not, you know, it's not, there's nothing wrong with you. And it's kind of in the water, so to speak. And then what we can do and, and just like, like Madeline said, let's keep it super simple and practical things that you can actually do today that will help you feel better tomorrow and will actually increase your energy tomorrow. And that's the beauty of these habits is like, they're so simple, but they're highly impactful and they really make such a big difference. And I want to jump, I'm, yeah. I'm going to hold myself yeah. back, but I just, I just want to okay. jump for one sec and yeah. to say, yes, like what I did notice um, over time, and it was a question for you, like, yeah, I, I noticed the increase exponentially. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like, I, it's interesting to hear that increase over time because I have absolutely notice that i mean there's dips in this valleys but mm -hmm. over time it's like money in yeah. the bank yep that's i use that analogy all the time it oh, is okay it's like we go into energy deficit but when we're doing the habit it's like we're filling up the energy bank mm -hmm. and then we have a surplus and then when we have a surplus that's when life gets really exciting because it's like okay now what now what's possible for me like when we get our health dialed in and that's really what i do i help women that and mostly women i have a few men, <laughs> but it's mostly women that 
and they are relatively healthy already because I'm in the, the yoga world and I'm a yoga teacher. So people that come to me are already, you know, doing a lot of good things. They're usually eating pretty healthy and they're already, you know, maybe doing some yoga or maybe even meditating, but it's still like, they just still don't feel as good as they know they can. And they know that there's just some habits that they could tweak and improve on and feel better. So it's really about dialing in these, these simple ways of taking care of ourselves so that we can have that surplus so that we can, you know, and my whole thing is like, it's the habits are not the end point. The end point is like living your purpose and really feeling like you are living a life that you have created and the life that you want to live and to truly love the life that you're living. And that's the point. And that the habits are just like foundational to being able to do that. So I really, I'm, I feel so strongly that we all have to start here with just basic self-care and things that most people just don't have dialed in. Most people are just not really doing these habits. And so we're going to talk about why, why that is, and most importantly, how we can start to make those changes and make them permanent changes. So that, and like Madeline said, it's, it is about the consistency of them. So the, the problem is, you know, people don't have these habits. People don't have, don't live very balanced lives and they're out of rhythm with nature. So what does that mean? I'm, and I'm curious, I'd love for this and I'd love for you guys to chime in if, if you would like, but even if you don't wanna speak, you can, you can speak or you can type it in. Like, what does that mean to you to be living out of rhythm? Like, does that even, does that, that even make sense? Like when I say that, does that, does that resonate or does it make sense to you? Do you, can you kind of think about what that means? And I'd love for you to share or type it in or unmute yourself. Yeah, we're a nice small group. So yeah. um, by all means, if, if any of you want, nope, no pressure if you don't want to. Um, and always, yeah, there's the chat at the bottom too. So yeah. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, I think for me being out of rhythm just just kind of means everything I do is paired with this cloudy self-doubt. Mm. Um, so it's, it's just not being in tune with being kind to myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, you said something really important, which Ayurveda really understands that the, the mind is the starting point and all changes start in the mind and our mind is actually our most powerful tool to heal ourselves but that being said we also have to know how to manage our mind and how to shift our thinking and and process feelings and and be able to not be at the effect of our minds and the thoughts that our minds present to us like self-doubt and you know all those things that create self-doubt and low self-worth and and then change how we show up and how we take care of ourselves so you know when we're living out of balance and out of rhythm we have low energy and we have a whole lot of other problems as well and then as a result we overcompensate by doing things like overeating or over drinking or over shopping sometimes overworking over you know, anything over Instagramming, Facebooking, Netflixing, all those things, because we have these negative feelings and then we want to seek relief from them. And all those things are ways that create relief. They create a little bit of a distraction and a bit of a numbing, but all those things then create their own problems. So then we get stuck in this vicious cycle of feeling bad, but then doing something that feels good temporarily, but the net effect is negative. Mm -hmm. And then we just, it becomes a habit because a lot of those things are highly addictive and they're addictive because they, I don't know how much you talk about like hormones or anything, but dopamine, you know, whenever we eat, we get like a squirt of dopamine mm -hmm. and certain foods more so like anything with sugar or flour or processed, it gets, it creates like a big dopamine hit. So we have this big feeling of reward and of pleasure and our brain remembers that and it's like oh when you do that like when you eat or when you drink or when you grab your phone that feels good in the moment so 
remember that next time you're feeling bad. So next time we feel bad, we, we're like, our brain remembers, oh, you should just eat something because you'll feel better. But then we, we have to deal with all the consequences of that, of either weight issues or digestive issues or hormonal issues or, you know, all the other things that come from doing these things or we're spending too much and then we, we're going into debt or we're procrastinating by distracting ourselves and then we're not, you know, as productive as we could be. Mm-hmm. Can I, I've just got yeah. it. You know, yeah, something is popping up. So I'm, I'm really trying hard. No, no, you don't have to. Don't have to okay. try hard. Okay. Um, I'm even thinking about like it sounds like that short-term gain, but then in the long term it doesn't help us. Like that mm-hmm. short-term uh, dopamine burst mm-hmm. that you get. And I'm thinking back to myself becoming burnt out. It would give me pl- great pleasure to help people like to see more clients, to give more of myself um, away. And and it would feel good in the moment to, I guess, people please Mm -hmm. um, in the moment, but then realizing in the long term, it just totally burnt out my my system. But it's It's really hard. It is hard. Yeah. So, so why do we do this? Why? And that's like always, I, I, I was a psychology major, so I've always been interesting interested in, in behavior and habit change and psychology and mindset because you know I want to understand why do we do why do we self-sabotage like why do we do things that we know aren't good for us and you know it's like we have the devil on our shoulder and the angel on our shoulder and there's this kind of like back and forth fight that's often going on between them of like do this but it's not good for you but but it'll feel really good but I kind of want to so it's a question of nature and nurture so nature being as human beings what is the what is our primary motivation what drives all of our behavior on a very primal level my guess is pleasure uh, yeah. well, you guys can use chat. Well, survival. Bit. Yeah, absolutely. You said survival of mine, right? Right. You have to survive in order to have pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Survival. It's like the first things first is like, we just want to survive. Now, thousands of years ago, in order to survive, now what you said, Madeline's right. There's a, the, the, the four primary motivations are the pursuit of pleasure because eating, like I said, every time we eat, it creates a dopamine hit. Now nature designed it that way so that eating felt good so that we would keep doing it so that we would survive. Now, the other, the second one is relief from pain. And that's why, you know, when we're outside and it's cold, we want to do something. We're motivated to fe- to like seek warmth, seek shelter that helped us survive. The third one is conserving energy. Now, a long time ago, thousands of years ago, we had to work really hard to survive a day. We had to go hunt for our food. We had to go forage for our food. We had to do, you know, do so much more work. And so our brain was like, you need to do like a minimum amount of work just to survive. Nowadays though, <laughs> we don't really have to do any work to survive. It's very easy. And so, but we still have that old wiring, that evolutionary wiring that tells our brain to like, take the path of least resistance, exert the least amount of energy. And now though, it's just making us all really lazy and technology is being created every single day to make our lives even easier and things even more convenient. So we have to do hardly anything just to survive. And the fourth one is, is connection. And you know, sex feels good for a reason. So we would procreate and way back when, in when we were more in like tribal situations, if we were kicked out of the tribe, we were gonna literally die. So it was a life or death situation. We still have that wiring that we really wanna be accept, accepted. We really wanna be liked. And our biggest fear is rejection of being kicked out of the tribe. And this is why we go to things like people pleasing. And when we people please, we're really just trying to manipulate other people into liking us so that we can feel accepted. So we will take actions and we don't think of this logically, like it's not consciously I'm gonna manipulate this person, but that's really what we're doing. It's like, if we say yes to all these people and we you know, take on all this stuff and we overcommit ourselves, then they'll like me, then I'll be accepted and then I'll be safe. Mm-hmm. So 
the reason why it's so important to, to really understand this, that it's like this old evolutionary programming to seek pleasure, avoid pain, conserve energy, and basically people please, is not like there's nothing wrong with you. And the thing is like when we do these behaviors, like when we overeat or overdrink or overspend or people please, or, you know, not choose to exercise, we think that, oh, I must be flawed. There must be something wrong with me, but you just have a human brain. And that's, the, you know, this primal brain that we have, that we all have. And that primal brain is old and it's strong. And it's, 99.9% .9 of the time, unless we've trained our minds otherwise, is going to win. And we will end up seeking instant gratification and momentary relief and pleasure at the expense of our long-term well-being and health. So the nurture part is, I don't know about you guys, but my mom was a bit of a workaholic. She was a little bit OCD in terms of like cleaning the house and she was I didn't get self-care modeled to me in my family. Like I, that was not part of my upbringing. I don't see it as really being part of our culture. So, you know, we're in an environment where being more productive, doing more, working harder is really, um, makes you seem like you're, it's like we, we hang our worth on how much we do and how much we get done and how productive we are how busy we are. We feel like, you know, if I, I'm busy, then that must mean that I'm important and I'm valued. And so we, it's just not, you know, we didn't grow up learning how to take care of ourselves and how to live in rhythm and how to actually have habits and routines built into our day so that we could have the energy that we want and experience the health that we you know, really want so that we can do what we want in our lives. And when we do realize, oh gosh, you know, I should probably eat a little bit healthier or maybe exercise a little bit more. The way that we approach trying to change our habits is through willpower. We, we decide, say it's like January 1st, New Year's Day, we're super motivated, clean slate. I want to, you know, do a whole lifestyle overhaul. And so we're, we're motivated in the beginning and we have a lot of like good feelings because we think, oh, it's gonna be so great when I'm just more active and healthier. But we're in that moment, we have good feelings that create that motivation that to help us take action in the beginning. But then one day comes and we're, our primal brain's like, oh, it's, you know, that just seems hard. Or I'd rather do like the easy thing. I don't want to exert energy. I don't want to, I don't feel like we're working out today or I don't want a meal plan or I don't want to cook. And that old primal brain is basically, it takes over. And we do this repetitively and we give up on ourselves and we throw in the towel. And then again, it just perpetuates this vicious cycle of not being able to be consistent and reach our goals or make the changes that we want. So willpower doesn't work long term. So we don't really want to use that strategy at all <laughs> as much as possible. Mm. But we'll, be, we'll talk about that today a little bit of like what, what does work? What can we do that is actually effective in making the changes that we want? That's so interesting. Willpower doesn't work, you mm -hmm. know, and we spent so much time beating ourselves up, yeah. you know, for lack, lack of willpower. Yeah, it's because so we're using something that's that not that effective. Yeah. 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 I know. And, and another thing I hear a lot of people say is like, I just, I'm not motivated. And it, it's, it's normal. It's again, it's that human tendency to just want to take the easy path. And that's, so that's, you know, if you take one thing away, I want you to know that like, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just the approaches that we've been taught throughout our life are not effective. For most people, I mean, willpower is a muscle that you can build and get, you know, you can be get better at it, but it doesn't really work across the board. It works sometimes, but it's like motivation. It's unreliable and usually not around when we need it the most. So I want to ask you, what does having low energy, like, what is it costing you in your life? Like, what do you notice? How, how do you see yourself being affected 
by not having the energy that you want. And you can type it in or you can unmute yourself. Like what do you do because you have low energy or what do you not do because you have low energy? Um, I think uh, I'm going to speak for just myself. Yeah. But it's about taking a lot of moments for granted, um, not even just with your own life. You know, I think a lot of people say my own life is passing me by, but um, but even important moments that, you know, you won't get back with other people in your life because time goes on, but, but you might not necessarily partake. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just a sense of, um, you know, missing even out. more than, yeah, missing out, but even, you know, just really taking for granted those really important heart moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Lisa or Pat, is there anything you want to add to that? No, it's totally okay. You're good. So what people tend to do with low energy when they have low energy is go to caffeine or go to sugar or go to food in general, try to like eat to, to have more energy. And again, like I said before, it's like all that stuff has its own effects. Like too much caffeine starts to wear on our, on our adrenals, sugar, messes with our hormones, food, just overeating. Again, it messes with our hormones, our metabolism, our digestion. So it's, it's not only low energy, but it's like the things that we're doing to deal with low energy and the consequences of those things. And then what we're not doing, or, you know, you might maybe you're not exercising as much as you could be or should be, or maybe you're not, you know, taking the time to plan and, and cook healthy meals. Or maybe you're not, you know, waking up as early as you would like because you're tired and you just stay in bed longer and then you, you know, miss out on that time for yourself. So it's important to really look at these things of like, how is the low energy really negatively impacting my life? Because until we really presence that, we're not really that motivated to change it. So I was there too. And when I had my, I have two sons, they're now nine and 11. Are any of you guys moms? Mm -hmm. So you, you know how hard that is in the beginning. And I, I was living in New York city when I had my first son and I, I didn't really have any family there. And I remember, you know, we took our son home from the hospital. And I think the next day I was like cleaning the house and cooking and like still doing everything I was doing before, but on no sleep. And I was just continuously doing that. And then I, I know I was suffering from postpartum depression, which I think most people do because of this lack of self care and, and really knowing how to, to rebuild our energy, especially after something like that of having, having a baby. So we really do become depleted physically, mentally, emotionally. And then we moved to Kelowna when my son was nine months, 10 months old. And it was like a, such a change for my life, as you can imagine, from New York City to Kelowna. I don't know if anyone, any of you guys have been to New York City before, but it's quite different. It couldn't be more different than, than Kelowna. So I felt totally out of place. I was lonely. I didn't have my own friends. I didn't have a community. And the way that I coped and I was exhausted because my, I never had good sleepers. <laughs> None of my, neither of my kids are, uh, were good sleepers. So I was always just so tired from being woken up a million times in the night. I would wake up and have like three to four cups of coffee just to get me going in the day. I would eat a, like a whole bar of chocolate every single day. I would just kind of snack all day long. And then at the end of the day, I would have a few glasses of wine because I worked so hard and I, you know, I deserved it. And that was like this vicious cycle that I was stuck in. And I was also, I, I tend to, I love my work and I tend to overwork. And so I was doing all that and overworking, staying up too late, and then just really feeling like I was not in control of my life. And I felt resentful for not having time to myself, having to like basically take care of these kids all the time and never being able to have a break. And I, I was stressed out. I was burnt out. I was 
really just unhappy and unsatisfied. And I was a yoga teacher and, you know, yoga gave me these like moments of relief, but they never lasted. It was like, I'd feel good for a little while and then I just kind of go back to feeling crappy. And then I found Ayurveda and I, Ayurveda uh, for, in the beginning, it was really just, I, I was the reason why I was attracted to it because I wanted to learn more about you know, kitchen medicine and using spices and being able to heal myself from like common cold and flu and things like that, like home remedy stuff. But what I realized and what I didn't know was that it was so much more about lifestyle and of really starting to align your daily routines with the rhythms of nature, which was kind of a, a foreign concept to me because I've always been a city girl. I, I lived in Houston, Texas for the first part of my life and then New York City for 10 years. So I was always kind of disconnected from nature. <laughs> I was always in my, my air conditioned box that I was living in and living, uh, working in restaurants for you know, many years, staying up all night, sleeping during the day. And so when I started to make these changes, which just look like eating dinner a little bit earlier and going to bed a little bit earlier, waking up a bit earlier and having a morning routine, I started to feel so differently. I had so much more energy. I gave up coffee. I took out 85% of sugar in my diet, stopped eating chocolate. I started eating so much healthier. And, you know, these little things, I mean, physically I got healthier and I had so much more energy and my immune system was stronger, but mentally I was so much happier. And in Ayurveda, there, you know, there's a deep understanding that there's a connection between the body and the mind. And the approach that, you know, in the West that we often take is like, well, just focus on the mind. And if there's a mind problem, just look at the mind. And if there's a body problem, just look at the body. But in reality, they're, they're intertwined. So you can't really effectively heal one without healing the other. So I, I not only was happier and just had like more stable moods and more, just more clear, but I had a sense of purpose and direction that I never had before in my life ever. Like I never really knew what I wanted to do. I was always just kind of going with the flow and just kind of seeing what was, you know, interesting to me at the time, but I didn't really have a clear sense of direction and of like, this is what I meant to do. And it's like the clouds parted and I was so, my life was so changed by the simple wisdom of Ayurveda that I knew that like, this is what I meant to do. And ever since I've been dedicating my life to, you know, doing things like this right now, or what we're doing right now of sharing this wisdom with as many people as possible. So that's, that's really how I, how I got here and why I'm so passionate because it really, it changed my life. And then I've watched it change the lives of so many of my students. So the, the power of habit, I think it's important to just touch on that briefly. And habits are behaviors that we repeat so many times that they become automated. They just, just like brushing your teeth. Like you just do it every single day, hopefully, without even thinking about it. And there's things that you do that are because of our brain's tendency to want to be efficient. We want to try to delegate as much to our subconscious brain as possible. So when we repeat something, our subconscious brain basically takes it over and is like, okay, I got this. I don't have to think about this anymore. So this is why we can drive without like having to think about every single thing of like pushing on the pedal and steering and looking, you know, and all the mirrors, it's, it's pretty automated. So we want to get our healthy habits automated. So we don't have to think about it. So we don't have to stress. Should I exercise? Should I not exercise? What should I eat? Should I eat this? Should I not eat that? It takes up so much brain space and it's just not like our brain wants to be efficient. doesn't want to use up all that brain space. And when we have habits, then we don't have to use our, we don't have to use willpower because it just happens automatically. And we don't have to use up brain juice for deciding what to do. It's just, we kind of go through the motions. Have you guys ever heard of the concept of decision fatigue? So I was uh, thinking about Barack Obama's, uh, he's got four, two, yeah, two white shirts and two pairs of black pants. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was simply because he didn't want, 
he wanted to save his decision making for the big decisions, not exactly. what he was going to wear that day. That sticks in my mind. Yep. Mark Zuckerberg, same thing. He has his black shirts, I think. Yeah. Easy. And a lot of, and I think, you know, a lot of successful people, people understand this concept. It's like every, we have to make so many decisions in a day. And we don't even realize we're making decisions in our moment to moment experience. It's like, when you wake up, do I stay in bed? Do I get up? When you get out of bed, you know, what, what's, you know, do I check my phone? Do what, how do I answer this text or this message or this email or all, all those micro decisions are slowly like depleting our willpower and our decision making capacity. And I like to think of it like this. When you wake up in the morning, it's like you have this bucket of decision making capacity. And every micro decision you make, it's like pulling out of the bucket. It's like using it up, using it up. And this is why at the end of the day, we often make the worst decisions because we've completely depleted our willpower. We've used up all of our brain juice on all those little decisions. And then that's when we end up making like bad food choices or you know, snacking too late or watching too many Netflix shows. And it's like, we, we just can't even make good choices at that point. So that's why it's like when we build in routines and habits that run on autopilot, we no longer have to make a conscious decision to do them. And we get the benefit of just doing those things that are good for us every single day. So let's, I just want to keep, a, keep an eye on the time because I, <laughs> I can talk all day long about this stuff. I was thinking about that, Donna, and I, I won't. I, yeah, no, it's okay. Well, I, I like the back and forth. You know, if I would have known this, and I want to go back, like, you know, even 20 years ago before I kind of entered chronic fatigue, you know, mm -hmm. I can see um, all those little ways that I was leaking valuable energy. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. like it's almost like <clears throat> too much paralyzed in decision making. Um, you know, putting energy where I, it, you know, it was, um, wasn't being used efficiently. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you know, that over yeah, time, silly decisions. Yeah. over time ends up to this big, you know, big, like a big ball of chronic fatigue syndrome. Yes, you know, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I guess it's never too late to undo all that. No. And that's the beautiful thing about the body. It's like, once you create the right conditions for your body and you start taking care of your body and just bringing it back into balance by living in the way that our bodies are intended to live. And that's the amazing thing about these habits that I teach. I teach it's 10, it's 10 habits, kind of condensed into eight habits now that these same habits I've seen people overcome chronic fatigue, lose 60 pounds, be able to completely get off of anti-anxiety and antidepressant pills, get off sleeping pills and overcome a lifetime of insomnia, balance their hormones. I mean, so many things get better, like rosacea gone, eczema gone, skin issues gone, autoimmune issues you know, go into remission because what you're doing is your body has the ability to heal itself. You just have to give it the right conditions to do so but it is a self-healing mechanism. But the problem is we create so much more stress on our body, but with the way that we're living, that it's really, we just get more and more depleted and our body can't do its job properly. And so we just end up completely like wearing it down more and more over time. So the habits, and before I dive into the habits, I wanna just give you a little bit of a context so you can understand why. So in Ayurveda, there's a concept that everything is made up of the five elements. And I don't know if you guys can see, this is, I have like a ridiculously big um, <laughs> whiteboard. I don't even know that I, I'll use it much, um, but the five elements are earth, water, fire, air, and space or ether. And it's not obviously literally these elements, but it's the qualities of these elements. So when you think of like the qualities of earth, what do you think of? How would you describe like something that's earthy or even someone that's earthy? Sometimes we'll, you know, we'll, we'll use these terms to describe things and people. And you guys can type it or you can unmute. I think of someone grounded. Yeah, absolutely. Even ground in the dirt. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah, grounded. Perfect. Yeah, grounded. Anything else? I'm thinking of green or brown, like green and brown, ground, mm -hmm. grass, yeah. tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So grounded, kind of earthy. The way that we would, in, in Ayurveda, it's, there's actually just 20, it's called the gunas, but 20 ways we would describe these elements. So things like heavy, soft, slow, steady, wet. It's, you know, when you think of like the soil, it's kind of damp and the gravitational pull of the earth, it's like creates a heaviness and there's a steadiness. When you think of someone that's grounded, there's like a steadiness, a regularity. Now, when you think of water, think of like qualities of being like watery or fluid. And sometimes we forget like the very obvious ones, like obviously we, water's wet, like that's a very obvious versus dry. Um, it's also, you know, it's flexible, like it, water just shape, takes the shape of whatever container it's in. Mm -hmm. And it's also heavy, like the water will always go with gravity, it goes down. I'm thinking uh -huh. of the, uh, did, is that you, Amon? Oh yeah, go ahead, Bano. No, no, I was just thinking of how we get stuck in that freeze response. And I always like, um, you know, I'll say we're, we're water, we're not ice. Mm. We're, we're not meant to be frozen, but, yeah. you know, liquid. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Did you I, have I always think of Bruce Lee, where he says, be water, you know, yeah. whatever situation, you know, if, if something's pushing yeah. you, you don't have right. to, you can move resist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Love it. I like that. And then fire. What about fire? Like, and even like someone that's fiery. The temper. Yeah, yeah. Like the hot, the hot emotions. Heat, obviously, is like, again, one of those like just really obvious qualities. <laughs> and, and the opposite, it's kind of opposite water where fire, it goes up. Like the energy of fire goes up. Even a symbol of fire is an upward pointing triangle. And then air, if you think about like air, and sometimes we'll even use like these words to describe people like air headed or airy or. <laughs> yeah, I think of light and um, yeah. yeah, not, yeah, not, not heavy. Like... It's opposite earth, right? So it's like light, yeah. it's drying. If you think of like a fan going around in your room, it creates a dryness, a roughness. It's mobile, like there's a movement there's, and it's unpredictable movement. It's like the wind, it goes one direction then all of a sudden changes direction. And then the last one is space. So when you think of, and again, we can, like people can be described as like spacey. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like etheric, it's expansive, it's open, it's really cold. Like if you think of outer space. So why is this important? So these, ener these elements, they combine in very specific ways to create these energies. So earth and water combine, they just have a natural affinity to each other. It's like mud. Mud is like earth and water. And it creates the, the energy or the dosha called kapha. And kapha is the energy of lubrication and structure. So people with a lot of earth and water qualities, they tend to be, you know, have a lot of these qualities in their body and in their mind. So physically, they tend to be sturdier and bigger boned, sometimes heavier. They have a tendency to hold on to weight or to hold on to, to water, to, to retain water. But they also hold on to uh, memories. They hold on to stuff, like they tend to be hoarders. They accumulate. Um, there's a steadiness in just how they live. They, now, Kapha people, they love routine. Like they're really, like they like to have the same routines every single day, that consistency. And they're also steady in terms of like, these, are, these people are loyal. They're always there for you. You can count on them. And even like the water, people with a lot of kapha have like soft skin and often like thick hair and nice um like beautiful big features so the it's really cool because when you understand these qualities you can see them physically mentally psych you know psychologically energetically on all these different ways 
So when you combine fire and water, so that's the next one that, and it's not, it's less fire, it's more like oil and fire. And if you think of like oil really ignites fire, creates fire, or even like a candle wick wax, or even um, an oil lamp, that creates the dosha called pitta. Are you guys, have you guys ever heard that term pitta or vata, the doshas, kapha, pitta, vata? I forgot to even ask if any of you have, are familiar with the, uh, with Ayurveda, like have you ever heard anything about it or ever read anything? No, okay, cool. So yeah, brand new, awesome. So my uh, homework for you guys is to take a, a dosha quiz. So when, when we get off, just Google, what's my dosha? Actually, and I'm doing right now, I'm doing a um, free three part video series on, it's called Ayurveda Summer Camp. And it's happening right now. And actually, I'll just, I'll put the link right in the chat. So if you want to join, you can. It's free. And great. I, yeah. And it's. When I found out what my dosha was, it, it actually changed the way that I, um, yeah, that I knew what to do with myself. I don't know mm -hmm. how to explain. Well, you're, you're born with a dosha and it doesn't actually change, but the imbalance changes. Mm -hmm. So you can be one dosha, but have an imbalance in another. And when you get into balance, it's, you know, you just are your kind of like authentic dosha. Mm -hmm. So there's always negative and positive qualities to each dosha. I'm on a bouncy ball. So if you guys see me bouncing, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, so I, um, okay, so fire and water create the dosha or the pitta or the, um, the energy of pitta, which is the energy of digestion, metabolism, and transformation. So people with a lot of fire and water and pitta energy, they tend to be fiery. They tend to have those hot emotions like anger, or they tend to be impatient or irritable or hypercritical or judgmental. So I'm a predominantly pitta constitution and I can tend towards those when I'm out of balance. But when I'm in balance and when pittas are in balance, they, they tend to also be really good leaders and very charismatic and really good teachers and speakers. They are very focused and driven. They have, it's like the fire of, of vision. They have like clarity and they can, you know, really get things done. They can be a little bit over, you know, kind of overachieving perfectionists as well though on the, on the negative side. And physically that it's more of a medium, medium body build, usually pretty good muscle tone. Sometimes there's redness in the complexion. So if there's a ruddiness, that's a, a sign of a fire of, of pitta and even red hair, like right? red hair or freckles that can be a, a pitta quality. And the last one is vata. So vata is the energy that combines air and ether. And it's the energy of mobility, of movement. So people with a lot of vata in their constitution, there's a lot of movement. So these are people that are like super fidgety or they are the travelers, the people that like can't stay in one place. They're always like on to the next thing, on to the next thing. They're always changing their mind. They're always changing ideas. These are the people that like resist routine all the time. They hate it. They, it's like, it, it's too boring. It's not exciting enough, but it's exactly what they need to help them stay in balance. So emotionally, a lot of people with a lot of vata tend to have a lot of anxiety or fear. And they are just a lot of busy, busy mind. So what does this have to do with habits? Now these, all these three doshas, these energies are, <laughs> are in our body, but they're also in the environment and in the t different times of the day. So if we take a clock and I'll just really quickly on my board, I know it's not ideal because I can't even see the whole thing. Um, but if we take a circle, which represents a clock and we divide it into thirds, because there's three doshas, I don't know if you guys can see that or not. There. <laughs> so this is 10 o'clock, two, and six. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably not use it much since you guys can't use it, but you can now at least have a visual. Now, there's three energies for the three different times of the day, or the three, and it goes around twice in a 24-hour cycle. So when we think about right now, whether we, it's like, 1145. It's the middle of the day. And when you think of the, the five elements, the sun is obviously a fire element. It's literally a fire element. So it is the strongest right in this middle time of the day between 10 and 2. 
which means that the energy of digestion and metabolism is the strongest. Now that means that we have the ability to eat the most food during this time of day. So this is when we should have our main meal. Lunch should be the main meal. And when we were more in alignment with nature and in rhythm with these cycles of nature, this is what we used to do. Like pre-industrial revolution, we would be outside, we'd be in the fields, we'd be foraging and hunting. And then we would come in when it was so hot and that's when we would eat a big meal. And then afterwards we would have a little bit of rest and then we'd go back into, you know, back outside, back to work when it was cooler. And then at the end of the day, we would have just supper, which was just usually something really light and often like a stew or a soup just to kind of tie us over until the next day. Now, when the industrial revolution hit, all the men went to work into the factories. They were sent with their paper bags, their back, their you know, box lunches, and the main meal moved to dinner time. Now, this is a problem because as the sun goes down, our digestive capacity also goes down. And when our digestive capacity, we literally have less bile. Bile is what breaks down our food in our belly. So when we have less capacity to break down the food, it ends up just staying in our body and it kind of gets, it turns into toxins, which then create a lot of havoc. And this is, you know, digestion is so key, so important for our health. It is the cornerstone for everything, the, the health of our gut. So when we're eating heavy meals late at night or we're snacking late at night, we are putting a big burden and stress on our digestive system because we literally aren't, our bodies are not designed to eat large amounts of food at the end of the day. We're designed to eat the most amount of food in the middle of the day. So th this is why, the big reason why people wake up sluggish, brain fog, and no energy. So this habit alone is so powerful in increasing your energy. You will see such a big difference if you start to do this. Just switching dinner and lunch, where if you normally eat a heavier lunch or a heavier dinner and a bigger and a smaller lunch, you just switch. Lunch is bigger, dinner is lighter. And you will wake up feeling lighter, clearer, more energized, and everything, again, your body can start to heal itself because you're not creating more stress. And I like to think of, you know, when you eat a late dinner or a heavy dinner late at night or you snack late at night, then it's like you're taking, you're borrowing tomorrow's energy for today because your body's like, oh, I got to deal with this food. I got to like use up so much more energy to, to digest this food. So which leaves me with less energy for tomorrow. So that's habit number one. And because we're running out of time, I don't know if that... Um, I'll get to everything I want to get to, but I do talk about all of this in my Ayurveda summer camp series. So if you do want to learn more, I encourage you to join and then you can kind of get this. And it's also, if it's new for you, it's good to hear it a few times and because we can only absorb so much at any given time when it's all new information. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, like absolutely take your, I can, you know, I can imagine, I remember when I was first learning and it was like, well, what do I do in the evening when I'm peckish and want snacks? And I know you've got all the, the answers for, for all those questions. So I'm yeah. going to refer people to your video series for that. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, it's exactly. Cause it's time. like, and that's the thing. It's not as simple as like, oh, I know what to do now. I'll do it. <laughs> If that no. were the case, then, <laughs> and I, my favorite quote is, if information were the answer, we'd all be billionaires with perfect abs. So <laughs> information does not equal implementation, mm -hmm. but awareness, you know, being aware of what to do is, is the first step, but it's not the only step. <laughs> so the, the second habit, and just looking at this clock again, so this, you know, this first top one is Pitta, the energy of digestion. And then this one right here is kapha, which is the energy of lubrication and structure. So that is the earthy ones, like the water and the earth. Now, if you think about it, in the end of the day, between the hours of 6 and 10, there's like a heaviness to that time of day. Everything kind of slows down. 
and the, which makes perfect sense. Like we want to slow down and start to get more grounded to be able to get ready for sleep, to be able to you know, wind down. Now, the problem is most people don't do this. What do we do? We get in front of a screen. <laughs> Usually that's like the thing that most of us do. And some people even will work at night, which is what I used to do. I used to do both. And now I have really good boundaries around like, I don't do that. Like I, my phone is away. My phone's in the kitchen. I don't use my phone late at night and I limit myself to, you know, how much screen time I have at night too, because the blue light from the screens actually affects our sleep hormones, which I don't know. Do any of you have sleep problems? Like have trouble sleeping? Yes. No, kind of. Yeah. So, if you think about it, like our bodies are designed to sleep. So we, when, when our bodies are not sleeping, then that is a red flag that there's something out of balance. And we always want to look at these red flags, any kind of digestive issue or any symptom that our body is presenting to us is not just something where we want to like grab a prescription or grab some sort of supplement even, or a quick fix. It's like, no, why is this happening? What am I doing that's creating this? so that we can get to the root cause. And that's what one of the things I love about Ayurveda, it's really about getting to the root cause of what's happening. Because the covering up the symptom is not a long-term solution. It's just a short-term fix, which actually just often creates more problems long-term. So the second habit is, you know, this time between six and 10 is really time for us to slow down, to ground ourselves, to calm our nervous system, which I'm sure Madeline is giving you lots of tools for doing that. Like that's the time when we really want to do that because we want to get our body prepared to sleep because it sleep is so, 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 so important. I mean, we always, we know with low energy, you always want to look at that first. Like, am I sleeping? Am I sleeping? Well, it's not only if, if I'm sleeping, but am I getting good quality? It's not just about the quantity. The quantity is like seven to nine hours, 90, I think it's like 95% of, Adults need between seven and nine hours of sleep. Might even be more than that. So we, we wanna make sure we're getting that quantity, but then we also wanna make sure that the quality is good sleep, that we're sleeping deeply and it's restorative sleep. So we wake up feeling rested. And it's really important that like between the hours of 10 and two, we should be asleep because that's when the second pitta phase happens where our brain gets cleaned, our our organs get detoxified, our tissues get repaired. There's so many essential things that happen in the middle of the night, but only if we're sleeping and only if our body isn't having to use all that energy to digest our food. So that's why these two habits together are really key. Earlier, lighter dinner. And when I say early, I, you know, I, I like to eat between five and six, but I, I really recommend not eating past 7 p.m. And then nothing after, no snacks. And then being able to give your body that time to fully repair, to fully rejuvenate, to do all that deep house cleaning that's supposed to happen in the middle of the night so you can wake up feeling refreshed. So those two habits alone will increase your energy for sure. And then, you know, we go into like the morning routine stuff, which I'm going to, I'm going to leave it at that because there's uh, not enough time, but the morning routine, it's like we can do things in our morning that actually help us have consistent energy all day long. So, um, what was I gonna say? Okay, so yeah, and just imagine, like if you were doing these things, if you had more energy, what would be possible for you? Like what would change if you really woke up feeling like a, hundred, like a million bucks? Have feeling clear, feeling bright, feeling positive, feeling light, feeling good physically, but men and mentally and emotionally. Like imagine how different your life would be. And really think about like, what would you do if you had just tons of energy? What would you do differently that you're not doing now that you just feel like you just can't do right now? It's just not possible. We don't, you don't have to answer me, but I want you to think about it because it's, again, when we really think of like what 
is possible. And sometimes we, we don't even go there with our minds because we kind of write off that anything better is possible. We think that like how we're feeling now is pretty much what we're destined to feel. And it's not true. Because even the small changes can make a big difference, like I mentioned before. I'm so, just thinking of yeah. that. <clears throat> uh, sorry, like yeah. start yeah. contemplating what life could be like um, if mm -hmm. we were able to have more energy and just like spending a few minutes of time in your imagination. Um, you yeah. know, what, what would that be? And sometimes it can feel scary. Like, what is the best possible version of myself? Like, was I, you know, I, I used to kind of contemplate that, then feel myself kind of contracting, like, whoa, that, you know, what if? But it's, it's yeah. kind of a fun thing to do to let your imagination just go there and see, yeah. see what, it, what it might feel like, you know, out of what yeah. we know right now into an unknown, really. Yeah, and even if your brain is offering you like, oh, that's, you know, not possible, or I can't really make these changes. Just everything, every, any thought in our brain is completely made up, first of all. So knowing that is really important, that if your brain is making up that you can't, what if you just decided you would entertain the possibility that the opposite was also true? And that's a good tactic in general of like, I call it the constructive use of your imagination. <laughs> like we can, we have this ability to have, imagine anything we want. And we'll often imagine worst case scenario and imagine all the negative things and the, the worries and the doubts and the fears. And we were really good at that. And that's also like part of just evolution. Like I said, like we evolved having to look for danger and look for threats and see, you know, be on the lookout for, for problems. But now we still do that. And it doesn't actually serve us anymore because <laughs> we're not really that threatened, but we see like other things as threats now. So just let yourself, you know, and, and this is a big part of being able to make changes is to visualize them and to see them as possible and to practice thinking them because our brain is wired through repetition. So the more time you give to this of like, let me just pretend, let me just like for fun, because it also feels good to imagine that stuff. And whenever you are thinking positive thoughts, it's going to create positive feelings, which will just lead to positive actions. And so if the worst case scenario from all of this is that you take positive actions by imagining a better future for yourself. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? Yeah, we got a few minutes if anybody wants to if anybody has any questions about you know those habits or um any obstacles that you can see arising in that already so i just want to recap the i mean if you just focus on and i always start with the the earlier lighter dinner habit like just start by moving your dinner a little bit earlier until it's ideally before seven, and, and maybe you even go earlier than that, and then going to bed by 10. So 10 bed, and, and I always recommend going slow with your changes. So don't go from like midnight to 10, go from midnight to 1130, <laughs> or even 1145. And then after a few days, 1130, I go really slow because there's, it's like the rubber band effect. We try to like stretch too far and we try to overhaul and we try to make too many changes too fast. Mm -hmm. And we're using willpower to do that, which we've already determined doesn't work. And then we just end up going back and defaulting to our old ways of being. So if you do it slowly, your, your brain and your body get a chance to adapt and you slowly start to see yourself differently. Mm-hmm. I think that's a key part of it, Donna. I know we're, we're at 12, but I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, when you start, and they sound like such simple changes, um, which is what I really liked about it. They were, they were doable. And making one change, like one change, even a little bit, kind of, I don't know what the chemical process is, whether, whether it's dopamine, but there is a feeling of agency, like, yeah. I can do this. I can yeah. do this. And carving out... Um, 
that time for yourself to do it, I think is, is healing in and of itself, mm -hmm. whatever, yeah. whatever it might be. And I know sometimes where I really encourage everyone to do the, the free course with, with Donna, because I, <laughs> there were times mm -hmm. where I was doing all the habit or, uh, you know, falling off the wagon and thinking, you know, um, um, you know, why, why am I, why can't I do this? Or, you know, I, I did it yesterday and uh, get back on, you tend to overanalyze it. And I, I think it was you or maybe someone else in the course said, just stop thinking and just do the habits. And <laughs> it was probably the best piece of advice. Um, Cause it's like, okay, I can do that then. Yeah. You know, I don't have to overanalyze it. Yeah. And just see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And know that you are 100% in control of your actions 100% of the time. And I know this sounds ex extreme, but like if someone had a gun to your head, you would be able to do any, you would be able to take any action. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's stopping you is your thoughts. And your thoughts, you know, whatever the thoughts are that are basically making, trying to convince you that to take the easy thing. Remember, it's like back to that programming of like path of least resistance means zero change. And that's why it's people don't make changes even when they want to, because it's this primal brains, you know, trying to tell you to just stay in the comfort zone, stay what's like, keep doing what's familiar and easy, even if it's not optimal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And no matter where you are, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're coping with in your life, it's always possible to do one shift, one, one shift, what, where, wherever you're, you're at, I think it's always what you've kind of said, you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And um, I'm definitely going to, I'm going to post this and then is that link where you would recommend that people yeah, uh, for the summer camp. about you? And yeah, well, that's just the thing I'm doing right now, but you can just go to my website, donnaskoglin.com to, to find out more about me. But I highly recommend um, you join the, because it's a, it's just a really great short video series. Each video is like 15 minutes and uh, it's going on this week. And it's okay. It's good to just, you know, I might say things a little bit differently and I, I've, uh, there's stuff in there that I didn't say here so that you can really get the full, the full picture. Great. And when is the next Align and Thrive? Uh, Which in two weeks. Two in weeks two weeks yesterday. Time. Yeah. Okay. And are you still open for people? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and that's all, that's all on your website too. I yeah. know. So, oh. oh, great. Well, Donna, thank you so thank much you. for Thanks spending for having this me. hour with us. My pleasure. And take care, um, you guys. Yeah, get a Thanks hold of you. Link. All right, take, take care. Bye, bye everyone.